The 80s, the era of coolness, top hits and questionable dress sense. But besides the cringe outfits, this was also the height of the Cold War, along with the emergence of somewhat affordable personal computers. Yes, that's right children, not everyone used to have a smartphone or a computer at home. A computer was actually considered quite the luxury back then. But for those that actually did own a computer, there emerged various individuals that used their computers for a lot more than just word processing or playing Zork. These individuals were a subset of computer and tech enthusiasts, sometimes referred to as cyberpunks, crackers, or more commonly titled, hackers. So, for today's Mad Lad, we're going to be covering a story combining a pretty unique and mysterious hacker that tangled himself in some Cold War espionage who met his end under some very suspicious circumstances. Carol Koch, the KGB hacker. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Fume. Fume is an award-winning device that is all about helping you break your bad habits in an innovative way. But breaking a bad habit doesn't have to be an uncomfortable or drastic change, so Fume is here to remove the bad from the habit. Instead of using electronics and annoying people with giant flavoured clouds, Fume is completely natural and instead uses flavoured air. Not only is the air flavoured, it is made from using all natural delicious flavours that contain no harmful chemicals. So Fume is really all good with none of the bad. You can simply enjoy your habit guilt free and replace your old bad habits easily. Your fume will come with an adjustable airflow dial that is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers something to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. After trying the new fume flavours myself, I was honestly very surprised at how flavourful it is. It feels very fresh and the moving parts are great for helping to fight stress. I've been feeling great since using it. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard, it's... It's very, very hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Fume has also released some new flavour cores. These cores include orange vanilla, raspberry lemon, and sparkling grapefruit. I've had the chance to try all three of these flavours, and they are delicious. The orange vanilla flavour is sweet and citrusy, with a touch of classic vanilla. The raspberry lemon flavour is full-bodied lemonade, with a hint of berries. And the sparkling grapefruit flavour is a fresh and cooling fruity grapefruit. So join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash dankula or scan the QR code on the screen and use code dankula to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfumefum.com and use code dankula to save an additional 10% off of your order today. For once, we'll be talking about a hacker outside of the Anglosphere, and instead, we will be heading to Cold War Germany just when things were about to heat up. Now, Carol is quite an interesting hacker, as compared to more well-composed hackers such as Kevin Mitnick, Carol was quite the conspiracy theorist, which means he was probably right about a lot of stuff. But, of course, we will get to all of that in due time, but just as a warning, due to the era that this took place in and the way that Carl's life went, it may be hard to fully look into his background. But thankfully the main event that he was involved in was very well documented. For the most part. Born in 1965, Carl would grow up in Hanover, Germany with a relatively somewhat stable life because apparently his father had actually left Carol and his sister at a very young age for his mother to raise. However, 
This wouldn't go as smoothly as you would think, with Carol's mother developing cancer and eventually dying in 1976. Being left by your father at such a young age is hard enough, never mind having to deal with your mother also dying from cancer. As for Carol's father, he wasn't a golden goose either. Well, he kind of was partially. He was a pretty well-known journalist for a local newspaper, but along with this, he was also a very heavy drinker, suffering from regular problems with alcohol. We aren't sure of the extent of these problems, but I'm sure they weren't any good for Carl, especially at a young age. These would have had a very drastic effect on him, turning him deep down into a pretty troubled young man. Besides Carl's rough home life, he would continue on to school like everyone else, gaining an interest in astronomy. And he was even on the student council. So it seems that Carl had managed to turn things around even after such a rough start. This would lead Carl to his first computer in 1982, which he managed to buy after saving up enough money from being a member of the student council. But sadly... This wouldn't last long. Carl's father would have a long-lasting impression on him in two ways. This was via the gift of a book called The Golden Apple, along with a hefty inheritance of cash, because in 1984, Carl's father would also pass away due to cancer. Carl ended up with a good amount of money, with his father leaving him roughly $50,000. And this would go on to fuel a semi-bachelor life, just enough to also support his ongoing drug habits. Besides fueling his drug habits, it would also fuel his new luxuries, such as a new apartment along with a Porsche. I mentioned before that his father had influenced him with more than just the inheritance money. And that's true to an extent. Really, what would influence Carl would be the book his father had gifted him. The Golden Apple. This book was part of a series called Illuminatus, and as you can guess by the name, it discusses topics such as the Illuminati. This book would strongly influence Carl maybe a little bit too much. I mean, hey, plenty of people take inspiration from fiction, but Carl took it a little bit far. If I were to put him on a scale, he is somewhere between Kevin Mitnick and Terry A. Davis. You know, a bit more grounded, but also a little bit unhinged. For example, he would name his first computer Fuck Up, which stood for the first universal cybernetic kinetic ultramicroprogrammer along with his hacker name, Hagbard, which were both references from the Illuminatus trilogy. He would end up taking a little bit too much influence from the books he read, or at least this particular set of books, because he ended up viewing the world very, very differently truly trying to find out how deep the rabbit hole goes. Now, as we've seen with many other hackers at this time, they wouldn't really reach their full potential until they would start collaborating with other hackers. That was just the nature of things back then. Why try learning new techniques yourself when a group of five or ten of you can figure out things faster, share information together, and so on? So, generally, a good amount of hackers will end up clumping together in their shared interest. And, of course, it's more than just for technical greatness, but it's also to have a sense of community. A little gang to share your experience and learn new things. And also, some things can only be done as a group. And Caro wouldn't be any different. And he would end up getting involved in the early beginnings of the CCC. More commonly known as... The Chaos Computer Club, who we've actually talked about before in our Kevin Mitnick video. This would be a very short and fast introduction, but meeting various individuals in the Chaos Computer Club would lead to the main peak of Carl's story, and how he would become known as the KGB hacker. Or, well, one of the KGB hackers. Yeah, we'll get into it all later, but Carl wasn't the only person working for the KGB. Now, this is where the details of this whole story get a little bit sticky, since, again, most of the sources are personal accounts from individuals who were around Carl, and the sources had to be translated from German. So please, take a lot of what I'm about to say in this video with a pinch of salt. It's not like 
the hackers were posting publicly on Facebook or Twitter the stuff that they were up to. So all we have is word of mouth and very, very old forum posts, right? So we're going to do our best to make the story as accurate as we can with the very little information we had available. For example, we know that Carol became obsessed with hacking after reading the Illuminatus trilogy. That, and along with doing a lot of drugs, became pretty much his forte. I'm sure that there are other things that he was interested in since we do know briefly about his political interests and his early life in school, but sadly, most of this isn't highlighted. Because we all know what journalists are like. When someone isn't there to defend themselves, it makes it a lot easier for the journalists to just paint whatever picture they want of that person. Carl's main subject of interest would be hacking, and as we mentioned earlier, it's pretty rare that a hacker wouldn't interact with other hackers, be it for whatever reason. Humans are social creatures after all, even if you are a keyboard jockey. So, with that being said, eventually Carl would interact with other hackers at a local hacking group. This was before the term hacker got a bad name. In German, it sounds a lot more pleasant, titled as the local computer Stammtisch. I think, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. It's a stupid language. Or the computer regulars table. Basically, a regular meetup for all of the computer and hacking nerds to get together. It's hard to pinpoint exactly where they would meet, but from what we found, it would either be at a local cafe called Fillmore or at a bar known as Casa Bistro. This is where the term Stamtish comes into play, because they would regularly meet at the same table, the regulars table. This is a pretty common thing with different hacking or computer clubs, which continues to this day, where they'll meet at a local bar or pub and discuss computer things and new activities. Although, at these modern groups, a lot of the people that are in attendance are undercover feds. Their computer gatherings would be titled Lightstale 511, or in English, Control Centre 511 numbered after the area code of Hanover, although it seems in the later years it would just be referred to as CCC Hanover, as the club would soon become an extension of the Chaos Computer Club, which is still active to this day. So, with that in mind, this would be the main turning point in Carl's life, as this is where he would meet some influential figures that would throw him further down the rabbit hole of becoming a proxy KGB agent. Oh well, maybe not an agent, but rather a cheap predecessor to modern day cyber mercenaries. Now, in reality, we aren't 100% sure about Carl's hacking capabilities or prior hacking activities, because that's not the type of stuff that hackers usually talk about publicly. It's not like hackers to make a blog post saying, Hi everyone, here are all the crimes that I've committed, because that would be fucking stupid. But what we do know is that Carl would need a lot more help to get anything going. This starts off with connections, and as we've already established, he got off to a good start with interacting with some other tech wizards. But he would need some virtual vagabonds along with some more dodgy individuals. This brings us to Carl meeting a croupier by the name of Peter Carl, who would apparently go by the nickname Pedro. You might be thinking, well, Dank, this guy's just a croupier. What makes him so integral to the story? Well, Pedro wasn't your usual croupier because he had a decent amount of connections. And along with this, he had a very big drive for making a lot of money. Which makes sense, him being a croupier. So what big idea would Pedro have to earn some quick cash? Well, that is where Caro comes into play. We aren't sure exactly how he came to get this idea, but his main plan was to gather a group of hackers and then steal information from the evil west to then filter it into the USSR. Because at this time there was an embargo on trading certain technological information in both physical and virtual ways, especially with Soviet Russia. So that means the USSR was very lacking when it came to computer technology at the time. So Pedro saw demand, he just had to take care of supply. 
and saw this as the perfect opportunity to earn some quick commie bucks. For starters, Pedro was no hacker. He was only a fixer. So of course, he would need a technical team. But what he would bring to the table was his physical networking rather than any kind of digital skills. He would be able to get contacts within East Germany and propose a deal. Hopefully to some very interested Soviet officials. So to find his team of hackers, Pedro would just go to the hacking club that Carl attended. And when going to these meetings, Pedro was looking for the perfect candidates. We aren't sure in what order who was selected, but what we do know is that Carl was more than a perfect fit. An ideal recruit has qualities such as being rather amoral when it comes to his cyber ethics, vulnerable due to his family affairs and reliance on drugs, and lastly, a drifting nobody who could do with some extra cash. What more could you want? As for the rest of the team, most of them were networked via Caro himself from various hacking meetings that he had attended. And the team included the likes of, and I'm going to butcher these names, I'm very, very sorry, Hans Heinrich Hubner, a.k.a. Pengo, named so because he was apparently addicted to a game called Pengo. Then there was Dirk Otto Brzezinski, who most people just called D.O.B. for obvious reasons. He was a man who, on the outside, dressed like he worked for a corporate office and was quite the programmer, but he was actually currently on the run due to fleeing his mandatory military service. And lastly, there was Marcus Hess, a.k.a. Armo. No clue why he was called that, but apparently it was after a popular children's book called Armo from the Ice. So this would be the dream team that Pedro would need, which would lead to Caro, a.k.a. Hagbard, D.O.B. and Pedro driving into East Berlin in 1986 to eventually meet their contact. Now, when they got there, I don't think they had much of a plan in terms of finding a contact. In fact, I don't think they had any plan at all. Because apparently, they were just straight up walking into the trade admission and saying, hey, we would like to hack for you guys. <laughs> Which, of course, didn't work because absolutely no one took them seriously. Because, I mean, this is a Cold War scenario. Who in their right mind would trust some random foreigners in their early to late 20s who just walked up to them and says, Hey, we would like to spy for you. I mean, it's, it's a little bit sus. So who the hell was going to trust these young random weird guys who had just walked in here and asked if they could hack for the Soviets? Well... The Soviets, of course. Uh, at first, they did just ignore them and didn't take them seriously. But apparently, a KGB agent by the name of Sergei, which is obviously an alias, took an interest in the gang. So Sergei would be their ticket to the KGB, because Sergei recognised the potential of such attacks. And I mean, here, the USSR was on its last legs anyway, so fuck it, might as well give it a bash. Sergei took the new keyboard comrades in with open arms, or well, semi-open arms, and they eventually started setting up deals. At first, the group basically punked the Soviets, because the Soviets didn't have access to the majority of software in the West, so Caro and the others apparently just started searching for free and open source software online and sent it off to the Soviets as software that they had secretly acquired by gaining access to Western systems. When... In reality, it was the modern-day equivalent of just going on Google and searching for free software, downloading the .exes and then sending them over to the Soviets and calling that hacking. I'm sure that they didn't try and pass this off as hacking, but rather just took advantage of the Soviet's ignorance. So... That, that is pretty funny. But over the next two years, the Soviets would get more and more demanding, requesting more sensitive things from better software to straight-up credentials of systems in the West. Of course, they couldn't just keep passing off free software as stolen. They would eventually have to do some hacking. 
It's hard to pinpoint all of the areas that they infiltrated, but they started gaining access to systems throughout the world, from the US, Europe and Japan. The Soviets went all out and even wrote the group a little shopping list. This included the Pentagon, NORAD, research labs at Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, Genrad, Fermilab, NASA, MIT, the list went on and on. So yeah, their work was uh, cut out for them a little bit. They had a lot of potential targets and they had to come up with results fast so that the Soviets didn't just cut them off. And to be honest, these guys didn't really say much in the matter. They probably could have all went out and got normal jobs if they wanted, but they wanted some decent cash, because most of them were unemployed and they needed to fund their rather strong taste for various narcotics, mostly Caro. But as far as we've seen, a few of the others in the group did indulge in a good bit of the old hashish. Eventually, the group would focus mostly on American targets, hopefully trying to gain access to some sensitive systems that the US government would use, be it for space tech, top secret military data, or even attempting to get a copy of the latest edition of MS-DOS. Pretty advanced stuff for the time, at least. Now, what was interesting is, at this time, hacking was very different to how we imagine it these days. Or, well, pretty different in most aspects, with the fundamentals still being the same. The main difference was that the internet, as we know it today, didn't really exist, or at least on such a wide scale. At the time, major networks such as education and research centres or anything big and important to the government or academia were connected via telecommunication protocols versus the plethora of cross-country network connections that we have today. So instead, they would utilise the X.25 protocol, the predecessor to TCP IP. Don't worry, we're not going to get too caught up in all the technical jargon. That meant a few things. There were very few networks to actually connect to in comparison to modern networks where throw a stone and you'll hit a network. But most importantly, the connections were absolutely dog shit. They were absolutely terrible. It was nowhere near as fast as today's internet. In fact, it wasn't even anywhere near as fast as the speeds we were getting in the early 2000s. Basically, in many cases, it would take you days to download a one megabyte file, provided that you didn't get randomly disconnected while you were downloading it, which was also very common. Now, besides this, the one benefit of hacking in the early days is that security was shit. It was absolutely terrible. It was pretty lax, eh, to say the least. This would come in very handy for one hack in which Pengo and Caro hacked into some VAX systems in Singapore at the DEC Computer Centre. Apparently, the security on the site was rather lax, allowing them to employ previous techniques of simply using default usernames and passwords provided by the manufacturer to get access to the system. Yes, this technique is still used to this day because there are a lot of idiots out there buying electronic devices and not changing the default username and password. It doesn't work as much, but it still works. From there, they managed to retrieve some software that wasn't just some generic freeware. Specifically, they managed to get a copy of a program called SecurePack, which allowed system administrators to alter the user's status, which proved to be a very useful application for the KGB at the time. What they actually did with this software, we will probably never know though. But still, this wasn't the hardcore top secret data that the KGB really wanted to get their hands on. This would only be used as another way to keep the Soviets happy while the group tried to figure out how they would actually get into some more secure systems. Although using default system credentials can be successful sometimes, it wasn't reliable. You were basically just hedging your bets that the system administrators were stupid enough to forget to change the default credentials, which of course wouldn't be the case for every network. So they needed something that would definitely work, a vulnerability that they could reliably exploit without just randomly guessing. 
And, thankfully for them, a few months later, the systems would develop a very concerning vulnerability. It would turn out that two students from Hamburg had actually found an exploit in the VMS OS used by VAX computers. This was done most likely by mistake because the exploit involved a generic system used for most login systems. Basically, what they had done was on a VMS system, if they entered the wrong credentials, then of course they would be met with an error message saying your password is incorrect, please re-enter your password. Then, if they re-entered the password again and pressed enter again, they would be met with the same message, your password is incorrect, please re-enter your password. But, if you ignored the prompt and simply hit enter one more time, it would let you straight into the user's account without actually authenticating the user's input correctly. This was bad. This was very, very bad. Anyone could do it. You don't even have to be a hacker. Like, my gran could do this. Enter the incorrect password twice and then just press enter and you're in. This, this was awful. This was truly terrible. There was now essentially a massive zero-day backdoor into all VMS-based systems. This, however, was absolutely wonderful news for Carl and all of his friends, since they now had a surefire way of getting into systems that didn't involve just randomly guessing credentials. However, the vulnerability was soon tracked down by security researchers at a German company called Psycon. These researchers managed to find the specific issue with the operating system and they of course thought that this surely must be an accidental bug causing the exploit. But instead, they found that this exploit was no mistake. It was actually written into the code on purpose as a backdoor. Basically meaning the designers of the OS purposefully made this backdoor. Presumably thinking that no one would find it. See the whole, ah, it's fine, no one will figure that out shit, like, no one does that anymore. No software designer does that anymore. None of them would ever take that risk unless they are incredibly stupid. In the modern day, see if there is a flaw in your software, hackers will find that in five minutes. But it wouldn't just be Carl and Pengo doing all of the work. The other member, Marcus Hess, or we'll just call him by his hacker handle, Ermol, was pretty influential because he actually managed to get a copy of the Unix source code, which was way more valuable than the readily available open source software that Carl had previously sold off. After passing this over to the Soviets, they were apparently very, very impressed, fetching the gang a payday of around $16,000, which back then was a good chunk of change. In fact, apparently it was the most that the group had ever received during their whole escapade. They would carry on hacking for the Soviets over a period of two years, earning themselves roughly 90,000 Deutschmarks, which, if you aren't aware, was the currency used by Germany before the adoption of the Euro. Better times. Now, as I've previously mentioned, hacking was big, but it was still pretty underground at the time. And these hackers really started to make a name for themselves. If you haven't watched our Kevin Mitnick video, then please go watch it right after this. But what's interesting is that even Mitnick himself contacted various members of the CCC, especially to get some info on the newest vulnerabilities and techniques. The CCC weren't just some silly little group of nerds, these guys really knew what they were doing. Although Carol's group attended various Chaos Computer Club meetings and were members, their whole KGB operation was an independent plan from the Chaos Computer Club. Basically, as far as I could tell, they kept things quiet on their dealings with the Soviets, as I'm sure a good few of the members at the CCC, although pretty left-leaning, would not have been fans of collaborating with the KGB, never mind attempting to hack Western nations. But just to be very clear, the CCC were totally fine with hacking Western nations, just not for the KGB. But we only know so much and we only have so much to go off of. But from what we've seen, the group's founders and the CCC in general were not too happy once they discovered that Carol and the others 
were up to mischief with the Soviets. Caro, on the other hand, didn't really mind much because he aligned quite well with his hacking activities. Being quite the proponent of freedom of information, he believed that knowledge must be equally accessible to everyone, along with him also being a member of... I'm not saying that. Who were a German socialist party. Not that kind, uh, the, the, the other kind. During his involvement with the gang, Caro apparently had a trip to Spain, in which things got a lot worse for him. Not legally, but rather mentally, and in early 1987, he admitted himself to a psychiatric clinic where he would undergo rehab. It seemed that Caro was spending all of his money on drugs. Thankfully, he wouldn't be in there for too long and would eventually leave the clinic a few months later. But things weren't going perfectly for the group. A year prior, in 1986, is where they would finally make their mark as the KGB hackers, with apparently Marcus Hess being the most prominent in the hacks against the United States. Again, it's hard to tell how much each member did or didn't do, other than basing it off of statements from the individuals themselves. But Hess, aka Armo, was the one that would eventually break into the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. You see, one of Armo's tactics was to leapfrog from network to network, searching through each system to locate valuable data. This also provided him with some amount of obscurity, because whatever system he gained access to, they would trace it back to another network, either in the US or in Europe, but it was never a direct connection from his machine, since his connection looped through so many different networks, making it very difficult to track him down. Almost similar to a proxy, he would be able to hop between systems without the computer admins having enough time to catch him. You can imagine it like this, he would be online at random hours in Germany while gaining access to systems in the United States. By the time anyone had caught on, they would have to follow his breadcrumb trail through various systems, but all of that required the cooperation of all of the sysadmins of all of these systems which was a very long and convoluted process, and long before they even got close to locating his position, he would just close the connection. It was pretty smart for the time, especially since connection speeds were very slow. So, he took advantage of that. Another thing that would play in his favour is that system administrators were aware of hackers and their activities to some extent. And they would even tolerate hackers sometimes. You've got to think about it like this. At the time, computer security was shit. It was just shit, for lack of a better term. It was very, very bad. Most system administrators didn't even care that much, and they certainly didn't want to go on some wild goose chase for some hacker who could be located anywhere on the planet. Sure, they could attempt to track them down, but what was the point? It would be pretty time-consuming for very little in terms of rewards. So, they usually just left it. After all, why get out of your chair and actually do some work when... you could just ignore it. It's like when a junkie rushes into the local shop and steals a pack of steaks. Yeah, you could try and stop them and roll about on the floor with a smelly bastard when you're only getting paid £6 an hour, or you could ignore it because there really is no point in being a hero for fuck all. And to get a better example of how this snake trail looked like, you can actually pause the video here and look over it yourself. You can see where Hess starts in Hanover and leads all the way to a variety of networks across the states, to even Japan and Canada. And back then, there weren't the tools that sysadmins have now. So any sysadmin back then would look at this absolute headache and just think, fuck that, and just clock out of their shift. But very unfortunately for Armel and the others, they came across the one sysadmin who actually did his job. A rather goofy and quirky guy by the name of Clifford Stahl, who was at the time taking care of the systems at Berkeley Labs. And it wasn't because he discovered something major, you know, like there was a big flashing sign on the screen that said hacker alert or something like that. It was the most pedantic minor thing that made Clifford start sniffing. When doing his usual duties, Clifford had noticed 
a discrepancy in the computer lab's bill. It wasn't off by much, but there was an error of 75 cents. This was practically nothing, but Clifford felt like something was off. Most other administrators would have probably just left it as it is, but not Clifford. Clifford was very different, which is the best way to put it. The guy is pretty goofy and an interesting character besides just being part of this story. Clifford's profession was actually an astronomer, but due to the lack of jobs at the time, he'd apparently taken up work as an interim admin at the labs. When he found this issue with the billing, it of course made his brain rattle. He had found that there were two systems used to rack up the bill, but the difference of 75 cents shouldn't have been possible. Meaning that there was a user tampering with something because they couldn't synchronise the systems. After some investigating, it turned out to be the Deutschland hackers failing to cover their tracks. So, now that Clifford had discovered the hacker, he eventually looked into what he was up to. Now, the main issue was the fact that Ormo would only stay on the system for so long, as we discussed earlier. This would mean that Clifford would need to first keep Ormel on the system long enough for him to track him down to where the connection was originating from, backtracing from each network connection. But how would you manage to keep the hacker who was searching for top secret files on your system for long enough so you could track him down? Well, the solution was simple to Clifford. He would make a bunch of files containing so-called sensitive and top secret data discussing the Star Wars program, which at the time was a very big deal. If you aren't sure what the Star Wars program was, it was backed by Ronald Reagan and it was a system to defend the United States from nuclear missiles during the Cold War. Something the Soviets would have absolutely been interested in. And by making the fake file large enough that it would take a very long time to download, this would keep Armo connected to the system long enough for Clifford to track him down. This was basically one of the original honeypots. Furthermore, Clifford also left messages on the server basically saying, hey, if you need more details about the top secret Star Wars program, please contact us directly and we'll have to mail it to you because the data is just too large to transfer digitally. You might think, Jesus Christ, who the fuck is going to be stupid enough to fall for that? Well, let's just get on with the rest of the story. Well, for starters, Ormo was eventually traced while he was transferring the honeypot sensitive data, which gave Clifford enough time to see where he was. You might be asking yourself, well, what happened to the stolen honeypot file? Well, the KGB hackers did receive the file, and yes, they did pass it over to the Soviets. And apparently, when they informed the KGB that they had data about the top secret Star Wars program, the KGB said, bullshit, <laughs> and didn't believe them. So, as a form of proof, the group passed along the fake file to the Soviets, which would prove indeed that the fake file was real. And the Soviets were in complete disbelief and became very, very interested in this file. It was now all hands on deck to get the rest of the data. Now, how did no one notice that the file was fake? Well, it's because the hackers knew computers and the KGB handlers knew espionage. None of them knew about the inner workings of intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile defence systems. That was a job for scientists and engineers, and they were not scientists or engineers. I could throw up any blueprint on the screen right now and say, this is a blueprint for a stealth tank. Because how the fuck would you know? With that being said, the Soviets wanted to confirm that the data was real, however, because, you know, any old file can be written up. So, they wanted to add themselves to the mailing list that we mentioned earlier without arousing too much suspicion. How would they do this, you ask? Well, they would ask the Hungarian Secret Service to use one of their agents within the United States to contact the fake person in the file and then ask to be put on the mailing list. 
This would lead to an agent located in Pittsburgh named Laszlo Ballo, who was a Hungarian immigrant and not so secret agent anymore. By contacting the fake credentials in the file, this of course would alert Clifford to the KGB's involvement. This had basically provided Clifford with the evidence that he needed to show the authorities, who ended up going all hands on fucking deck after Clifford handed the evidence over. You know, a bunch of German hackers dicking around, the authorities wouldn't have given a shit. The KGB trying to spy on the Star Wars program, however, well... Yeah, that was pretty fucking serious. So eventually, Clifford would corroborate with the FBI on his findings, leading to the US and German authorities joining in officially on the investigation. So yeah, things were not looking good and the clock had started ticking. You would think these arrests would be very easy, but there was a lot of communication involved between various organisations, and rather than saying each one, I'll just show you a simplified chart of the communication. So yeah, you get the picture. But before the hackers were arrested, things would end up blowing up all over the media. Because you see, prior to the arrests, Clifford Stahl had published a paper titled Stalking the Wily Hacker, which covered the details of the scenario from the US perspective. This, along with media coverage, blew up the case and the general public now knew that KGB hackers were on the loose. It wasn't just the US media that covered it, but most importantly, the German media had made a pretty big deal out of it at the time, which was very bad news for the hackers because that is where they were from. This led to a lot of panic, specifically from, as you can imagine, the hackers themselves. In particular, Caro and Pengo were apparently really worried about being apprehended. Caro didn't help the situation much either because apparently in the past he had spoken to the media several times discussing his hacking activities and capabilities, allegedly even claiming that he could hack into nuclear sites and so on. He may have done this for a few reasons. Maybe he thought the media would help him make a name for himself. Maybe it was just to stroke his ego. Maybe it was to make a quick buck. Who knows, but whatever the reason... It really didn't help. What also didn't help was that the KGB hacking group basically damaged the reputation of the Chaos Computer Club, as apparently many journalists would try to interview the group along with publishing media that displayed hackers in a bad light. This led to a lot of the key members of CCC kind of disowning the group. A few in particular really disliked Caro and his group as they had basically torn down what the group actually stood for. Then again, I'm sure plenty of the other hackers actually respected what they did, but we'll never know the full story. As this went on, everyone else started to panic, and both Carl and Pengo soon sought legal help from lawyers. We aren't sure who was the first to basically pull the wool from everyone's eyes, but they wanted to look for some form of immunity to avoid any legal issues. You might be thinking, well, that's kind of stupid, they probably could have just ducked out and avoided it entirely. But you have to remember that at this time, most of them were pretty young. Some of them were even teenagers, and teenagers are very well known for making very poor decisions, even at the best of times. Never mind while being in a full-blown panic, because you might have just got caught helping the KGB during the Cold War. But they were right to be worried, because in 1989, they were all arrested, with the evidence from the witnesses coming forward, along with the trace being tracked back to Ormo's house. And three of them would stand trial. This would include Peter Carroll, who would receive two years in prison, Dirk Otto Brzezinski, who would be put in for 14 months, and Marcus Hess receiving 20 months. As for Hans Heinrich Hübner, aka Pengo, we aren't specifically sure what happened to him after all of this went down, but from what we can gather, he just carried on with his life, continuing to work with computers, but this time in a legitimate job. But what about the main man himself? Well, Karl Koch basically got off completely scot-free, but things wouldn't end happily for him. 
Ironically, compared to his previous political alignment, he'd end up working for the Christian Democratic Union of Germany as a driver for the state office in Lower Saxony. But now we get to the really contentious part of Carol's story that a lot of people still talk about today. On the 1st of June 1989, Carol Koch was found dead. He was found in a forest, seemingly burned to death. His child corpse was lying there for over a week as he was last seen alive on the 23rd of May. According to the police, the body was just bones when they found it, and of course it was officially ruled a suicide. But there were a few things that made people rather suspicious. The day that he went missing, and presumably the same day that he died, Carol had left work to go for lunch, and after not returning back, his employers reported him as missing. When the charred body was eventually found, it was seen that he had no shoes on, with the scorched earth around him apparently being in a very neat, almost perfect circle. Along with this, there was no sign of a suicide note. The problem is that apparently Carl had attempted to take his life before in the past, and having no suicide note doesn't automatically rule this as murder. But... The fact that he showed absolutely no signs of wanting to commit suicide, he chose to do it in an extremely painful way that would also just so happen leave a body completely unidentifiable, the fact that his shoes were also gone maybe so any footprints in the area would just be attributed to Carl since they didn't have his shoes to match up the prints, the fact that the scotch marks were in a perfect circle around him, almost like he didn't just pour it over himself and light a match, more like some one was standing there for a while pouring the petrol in a circle around him and also the fact as well as see to burn the body completely down to the bone that's a lot of petrol that is an awful lot of petrol that carl would not have been able to do himself because he would have died long before it got to that point and also the body was outside for only a week that's not enough time for local wildlife to pick it completely clean down to the bones i'm just saying it's very very fucking suspicious but the best way to look at it is this. If someone commits suicide and governments hated them, it wasn't suicide. There are also other things like he died on the 23rd at the age of 23, lots of number threes in there which relates a lot to the books that Carl was a very big fan of. Superstitious I know, but it ties in pretty well with Carl's conspiracy theories of the Matrix and Illuminati. Was it the KGB? Was it the Illuminati? Did the Matrix finally get him? Or did his mental health and drug use finally catch up with him? Sadly, we will never know, but the circumstances around his death are very, very suspicious. Carl was indeed a weird individual, with him playing a part in one of the most influential hacks of all time. He didn't get a chance to stop the Illuminati or prevent the downfall of the world from nuclear annihilation, but he did leave his mark on hacking history. The once keen astronomy enjoyer was caught by an actual astronomer in his later years, which might have led to his death. Of course, we can't put any of his death on Clifford because in the epilogue of Clifford's book, he did leave us with one last comment on Carol, saying, and I quote, The tragic death of Carol Koch has deeply shocked me. I did not want to kill anyone. Maybe you didn't, Clifford. Maybe you didn't. But someone did. Don't go anywhere. You sit right there. I've got live shows coming up in London this December and you can buy tickets to them down below and come to see me. I've got a small show at Comedy Unleashed and then I've got two big shows later in the week. You can, you can come to my shows if you buy tickets in the links down below. For the four women who watch this channel, you can buy them as an early Christmas present for your man friend or boy toy or whatever the hell you've got i don't i don't know what women do but still come come to my show and i will tell funny jokes and i promise i'll only be a little bit racist just a little bit just a little bit racist but anyway come come to my show i want i want to i want to see you all in person so i can fight you it's count thank you on youtube everybody subscribe